Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. We have such a treat for you today. First, we're going to be talking to Renee Lichtman about how he became a pro-Palestine activist. Uh, he is someone who is an artist and also survived the Holocaust, and he's been an activist for many different issues. And he's going to talk to us about what made him a pro-Palestine activist and his relationship over the years with Israel and how that relationship evolved. And then we're going to be talking to two students from Columbia University. One of them has been right now is uh, currently being targeted for their stance against genocide. And they have been suspended and evicted by Columbia University for their pro-Palestine activism. So before we start, though, of course, I want to remind you to give the show a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Oh, very exciting uh, announcement. We have passed 200,000 subscribers. So we've passed 200,000 subscribers. So keep subscribing, guys. The more subscribers we have, the more we get to spread this show and the interviews that we do with these really important guests. So thank you all for all your help. And thank you for um, uh, coming to the show giving a thumbs up, subscribing. And of course, you can come become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. So I'm going to bring on the first guest. Let me just introduce you all to him. Um, Renee Lichtman, born 1937, is a hidden child Holocaust survivor who opposes the ongoing Israeli genocide in Gaza. The son of two Polish Jews who fled to France during the 1930s, Rene was hidden at the age of two with a Catholic family outside of Paris after his father was killed during the 1940 Nazi invasion and his mother was forced into hiding. After the war, Rene moved with his mother to Brooklyn, New York. He was politically radicalized in the 1960s and became an active opponent of the Vietnam War. Rene was a founding member of the World Federation of Jewish Child Survivors of the Holocaust. On December 22, 2023, Renee took part in a demonstration outside of the Zeckelman Holocaust Center in Farmington Hills, Michigan, against the U.S.-backed Israeli massacres in Gaza. So welcome, Renee. Hello. Thank you. Thank of you. course. Thank you so much for joining. So I wanted to ask you, before we get into your Palestine activism, can you tell us about your life, uh, where and when you were born, and what happened to you during the Holocaust? Uh, yes, uh, my parents were both from Poland. And as you said, they came to Paris uh, uh, in 1933 and 1936, my mother in 1936. And I was born in 1937. Then... Um, uh, Poland was invaded, um, 38 or 39. Um, and, um, at that time, many young Polish Jews, like my father with left, left wing leanings, many of those were young anti-fascist and the, he joined the French army, uh, and it put him in the foreign legion. And so at, as soon as the war began, he was killed in action. I think that's it had an important impact on me because he was killed uh, fighting fascism. And um, at the time, uh, ne next to uh, veterans of the Spanish, Spanish uh, Civil War. So that's had an impact on me as well politically because they were all anti-fascist. Um, and I was, uh, but before he he went into the army. He found a location which was difficult to do to, uh, to hide me as a Jewish child. Uh, so I was hidden outside of Paris, about an hour away. Uh, and um, my mother um, could not take care of me. So I, because she was by herself in Paris. Um, and so I stayed with this Catholic family for the entire war, uh, became very attached to uh, to them, and so remember, I'm about seven or eight years younger than Anne Frank, so there are parallels. Uh, she was a little older than me, and she was with other people. I was by myself with this family, and my mother at some point in Paris had to go into hiding, so I didn't see her until the war ended. When the war ended, um, 
she came to pick me up and um uh, which happened to a lot of jewish children um and i began to live with her and learn about my jewish identity which i didn't know uh during the war because for safekeeping the less you knew about your identity the safer it was uh, so between 1945 and 1950 i lived in a, a yiddish speaking world it was a very very jewish world in terms of culture, in terms of cooking, in terms of all these cultural aspects. And everybody I knew spoke Yiddish, and my mother always spoke Yiddish with me. She spoke very little French. Uh, so I learned uh, I learned to be Jewish. And in 19, uh, but I always, and, and of course my mother was kind of jealous with for my feelings. I won't go into great details. My feelings for my French family, again, kind of common among children. Uh, did you stay in touch with them over the years? Yes, I stayed in touch with them all the time. And my mother, even though she was jealous, I guess, uh, she allowed me to visit them often when I was on vacation from school, et cetera, et cetera. So I spent a lot of time, even at the end of their lives, I, I visited them and I I went to their graves after they, they died. But uh, in 1950, I was with them actually that during that summer when my mother came to the United States. She married an American Jew, a religious Jew, and um, uh, wrote to me while I was with, with my French family saying, um, she's coming back to get me and take me to the United States. So at that time, I was 13 years old. I came to the United States, and I lived in, in uh, Williamsburg, in Brooklyn. Um, and again, a very Yiddish-speaking um, world. So. Uh, and my mother knew how to keep a Jewish home, kosher, et cetera, et cetera. But I was, oh, I was never religious. Um, uh, and then, uh, of course, at some point, I went into the U.S. Army and came out, and I was painting. I was already um, drawing when I, was, when I came to the States. I always drew. And I had, fortunately, some teachers who said, kid, you should go to this very special school in in New York called High School of Music and Art. And I, oh, I did. My mom went. My mom went there. Okay, well. And my uncle, yeah. And my cousin. Went, now it's LaGuardia, but yeah. Yes, so it's a very kind of elite. And I was one of the token, you know, working class Jews from Brooklyn. Yeah. There were too many of us, but. Uh, but it was free, but so everyone knows it's a free magnet school. It's uh, right. And with the elite, you know, we were the elite uh, in terms of music and art, fine arts and theater and all of that kind of stuff and uh, uh that's where i got my my art identity uh and i have of course i had my jewish identity from th that world that i came from but it was not a religious so i've always been an atheist you could say uh but very uh understanding of, of my history as a jew etc etc um and at some point you know after the i got a fulbright grant in painting uh, after i came out of the army and then the Vietnam occurred, so I became very involved in that. Uh, and at some point, um, I belonged to a, a group of uh, filmmakers, artists, etc. And I came to Detroit and I helped make a film called Finally Got the News. And I, since then, I continued to be on the left. Uh, and I was always a Jew who... Um, who was secular and uh, very left-wing. And I believed in those days in a democratic secular state uh, for Palestinians and and um, and Jews living together. And I I went to uh, you know demonstrations representing um, Jewish uh, leftists. So um, and then that period uh, ended. The war ended, and I went back to school. I got my PhD, and then I got a regular job. I had a family with three children and um and so recently of course uh little by little over the years um uh israel became more and more right-wing uh, and i began to uh, object to that but so today uh i've uh, and i actually i did spend believe it or not um as a survivor i spent uh, two weeks volunteering in the uh military uh, israeli IDF, the uh, Defense Forces, with some other uh, Jewish uh, child survivors. We spent two years uh, 
a uh, two weeks, excuse me, helping. Um, you know, so I have pictures with my uniform uh, in the army. Uh, so I was pro-Israel, but I believed in two states. I still do. Um, and um, there you yeah. are. Okay, uh, so this is you. Yeah, getting my epaulets, my little things. Uh, I forgot exactly what that anniversary was, and I get some kind of certificate of my volunteer work. Uh, and after that, of course, um, you know, as the government became more and more right wing and um, uh, I became more and more anti-Israel or anti-Zionist, which leads me to today where, I, you know, it's, it's extremely uh, complicated, but I've become more and more uh, openly uh, uh, anti Israel, anti Zionist in that way. And I've become kind of a, you know, black sheep or a traitor or a self hating Jew. They call it. all these terms, which to me mean, you know, at my age, I'm 86. Uh, you know, I'm not impressed by those terms, but it, it makes me a kind of a pariah in some ways in the Jewish community, except among young people like If Not Now or Jewish Voice for Peace. Yeah, I, uh, I think I'll leave it at that. And here's a photo. Uh, I think, Brad, we have a couple of photos of Renee from his youth. But here's, I just want to show this photo. Um, so there's you, right, with your parents? Right. So, so this is just before my father uh, goes into the military. And, of course, he gets killed right away. Uh, and how old are you at that point? I was about two years old. And my mother, it's the one of the few pictures of my mother smiling. After that, in the photographs, she doesn't smile anymore because my my father is uh, lost in combat. They said he never came back; he died, of course. So after that, she was not. Uh, we have some pictures, but she's not smiling. But right after that, my father had made um, uh, had made uh, um, uh, preparation for me to stay with this 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 family in um, outside of Paris in uh, Vergallon, it was called. It's still there. And I'm, I still go back there because uh, uh, I, I've been invited and I'm part. It turns out my town, I didn't know that, but they saved many, many Jews. Oh, uh, a number of maybe dozen Jewish kids, some of whom were my friends uh, in my organization. Uh, so we're trying to get them recognized by Yad Vashem. So that was oh. a family. Uh, yeah, and this is who? Who are these people in this photo? Oh, that's my uh, that's my French mom. I call her Mamon Anna, with myself with glasses. So this is after the war when I realized my vision was pretty bad, uh, and it's a it's a time that my mother uh, during a vacation when I go visit my my French family, my Mamon Anna and uh, her husband Papa Paul, and the, the the young girl, the little kid. I, I don't know who that was. I don't remember specifically, okay. but there were these kids who came and went because she was a kind of a caretaker. Yeah. So we're trying to get her recognized right now by Yad Vashem and her husband. So you're how old when you go into hiding? Uh, 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 two, two years old when the war began with my father. And he spoke more French than my mother. And, um, um, but it, it turns out through my, recent research that he knew that family from before the war. The community was a very kind of left wing right. part of the what's called the Red Belt around Paris. And they were all communists and socialists and anti-fascists. And so uh, they were open to Jews. They were not anti-Semitic. Uh, and so it was known among the Jewish community in Paris that First, this was a, a wonderful location to go on vacation. This was the countryside. And uh, secondly, if you had a child, maybe you could find someone. When we began, if you wanted your children hidden, which at some point the Jewish community did, uh, if they were going to travel and, um, and be flexible with, with children were somewhat of a hindrance in terms of moving around quickly. So they, if they could find a family to keep them, the children, that would be good. And that's what my father negotiated with my French family. They knew him. They liked him. 
Um, and uh, they didn't really know my mother because she didn't speak French very much. So he did a lot of these negotiations and then he died. Uh, so I spent uh, my the war years, four years of the, of the war with the family, with little knowledge of my mother because she had to go into hiding and stay there. She couldn't come and visit me anymore because it was too dangerous. So I didn't know anything about my Jewish identity. And with a lot of us children of the time, the identity was pretty a significant issue, for example, in terms of hiding, in terms of, uh, if you think of Anne Frank, she knew very much about her identity and it would have been difficult for her to hide, even though she could have had her uh, hair dyed blonde, gone to church and learned the prayers and all of that in church which is what a lot of young girls did. Uh, but in her case, it would, she'd have to lie the whole time that she was in hiding. And I've had friends that had to do that. In my case, because of my age, I didn't know anything, which was safe for everybody. But when when the war ended, I didn't know that I was Jewish. So I had to go through all this, this transition and all this trauma. And then, of, you know, becoming Jewish, what that meant, and then coming to the United States, it was emotional pretty difficult and right away i had a you know i had an ulcer which i mm. uh, and then i didn't get along with my stepfather who was very religious so i didn't have a happy <laughs> i didn't have a happy home and i was glad to go into the army i volunteered for the u.s army uh to get out of the house and um, uh, they were having fights over me and things like that and when i came out of the military i was um on my own, I was painting, I wanted to paint, and I moved to the Lower East Side and, uh, uh, you know, began a, a new chapter in my life, yes. But I continued to be in touch with my my French family until, until they died. Um, hmm. And um, what did you think happened to your mom? Why did you think she went away? Well, she had to go into hiding because uh, at the beginning, but I mean, what as you as a kid, what I mean is like you were two, you were two years old. I guess you were too young to to understand really what was happening. Yeah. But like, what did they tell you? They didn't tell me anything. Okay, uh, you were just passed over people, to this other people, family. People, yeah, people don't. They didn't say anything. There was this this thing about silence in those days. The less you said to anybody, right. the safer it was for everybody. And. So you, and and you you didn't have to be hidden like you were you were visible to other people they just thought or no, were you no, living no, no. no i was i was living in hiding in this house with my french family and i never went out so where never, in the house were you living like physically yes uh it's still there the house uh, i think we have a picture of it somewhere the house is still there i visited it recently as a matter of fact because i'm in the process of making a film about uh, that period uh, essentially, the, the, essentially the, the Germans, as soon as they got there, uh, they, they took, there was some resistance. It was actually the day after my father, the last message my father uh, was seen, there was a Red Cross had a message and, and the Germans were f having some resistance. This is at the very beginning of their invasion. They were having some French resistance from the French. And in my neighborhood, they, they picked up 15 hostages and they shot them. And it turns out, and I'm learning all these things. This is all recent history uh, and research that people are doing in, in my town and next door. Uh, and uh, it turns out those hostages happened to live right around where my house was. Uh, and of course, my, my French family knew of that. And I, I think, you know, that's why I didn't go to school. I didn't go to church. Even though I was baptized Catholic at one point towards the end of the war. Uh, so I, I really stayed in the house. We had a big garden. I, I, I thought it was big back then, a big vegetable garden. So we had food. And um, relatively speaking, we raised small animals. We had rabbits and chickens uh, at the lower level of the house, which was pretty common with those homes back then. And Mamona now told me a story once where she was shopping in town and and the uh, and people knew it's a small community. They knew each other, and you couldn't trust anybody. You didn't know who was who. You didn't know who was going to become pro-German, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so she was in the in in this little store. The husband was waiting on her, and the woman, the wife, comes out of the back of the room and says, "Madame Lepage, 
French mom was Anne Lepage. She said, Madame Lepage, you take care of children. You know, if you have Jewish children, you have to register them now with the authorities. And when you get a, um, a, a registration card, you get a big stamp on it, J, a Juif, or Juif, Jew, which was a period when they were separating the Jews. And you get an identity card. And so this woman is saying this to Mamana Nana, and the husband turns to her and says, stop asking so many questions and go back to do what you were doing. And so she, Mamana Nana was trying to tell me that you couldn't, you didn't know who to trust. Yeah. And so because of that, I, she didn't take a chance. I didn't go to school. I didn't, uh, I didn't do anything public. It was just too dangerous. And of course, many Jews from that town and we have the records and we have the names and the ages and the families and I've got pictures of who they are. And that's part of the film that I'm making right now. A lot of the Jewish families who've been coming there since 1920 to that town for summer vacation uh, were taken. They were taken by the, by the Germans or the French authorities turned them over, gave names and uh, many families, including children, uh, were taken to the gas chambers and you know, we have all the dates, et cetera, like that. So that's why I never really went out until when the war was over. And then one one time, Amon and I took me outside. And we walked to the corner, and um, the tanks were coming down the road. And I remember we, were, we lived in a very interesting location. There was a big forest where there would be firefights at times between Germans and uh, Americans. And right across the street from my house, there was a German foxhole. And the Germans from that foxhole came to, to my house at times to get water or, or whatever they did. But I'm, I'm sure at that time I was told to go upstairs and not say anything. And in those days, when the adults talked to you like that, you did what they said. You didn't stand right. around having a you know, democratic uh, uh, a discussion about, uh, you know, what you was saying to them. So, uh, and it turns out, that, of course, the Germans uh, um, fled. When these, the tanks came rolling down, we didn't know whether they were uh, Germans coming back or Americans, it turned out, because I remember the people around me talking and wondering what these tanks were with all this dust coming up because it was a dirt road. And they were Americans. So that was, I, I know people were happy. And some of these American soldiers took up those foxholes across the street and they came to our house. I remember that. I remember one of them specifically who came and uh, uh, had uh, some issues with his feet because, you know, if you if you had wet, wet feet and wet uh, socks, it was very dangerous. You could get gangrene. And and I remember this image of my mama nana washing his feet, this big, big American soldier, you know, in American uniform. And, and uh, she's, I remember coming down and having this image in my mind where she's washing his feet and drying them. And she explained later to me how important that was for soldiers. So that was the first American and American uniform. Mm -hmm. And then in Paris, we had friends who were American soldiers who happened to be Jewish. Uh, and of course, they spoke Yiddish with my mother and her friends. So that was an interesting, so that was my exposure to uh Jewish Yiddish culture um, and that Yiddish speaking, but again, it was not a religious, uh, although we lived right in Paris, we lived right next to a synagogue, which is still there, Rue uh, Notre-Dame de Nazareth, a synagogue. Uh, so, yes, that's, uh, and, and my mother, because, again, because of during the war, she, at the beginning, she could come and visit me once in a while, but at some point the Germans, you know, really just picked up anybody they could in the street and it was too dangerous for her to come and visit me. So I, I had no real contact with her. And when, when she showed up to me, she was a stranger. She had a foreign accent, you know, kids um, suspicious of accent. Yeah, yeah. She hardly spoke French and she was much younger and she was a Parisian woman, you know, very stylish and she was, you know, so different than my f French family. Uh, but she said, you know, I'm your mother and I'm taking you back. 
that happened to a lot of French kids. Right. I mean, a lot of Jewish kids, uh, wherever, you know. Yeah. Or whatever. Yes. And so tell us about how your view of Israel changed. Did you have an aha moment? Was there something that Israel did that made you think, okay, this is a, a, a country that I don't support, a government I don't support? Yeah, and it's pretty recent. Um, when the right wing, um, and I knew the right wing because I knew from Brooklyn, I knew Maya Kahana because he was, you know, he was from Brooklyn. And I remember going back when I was living in Detroit and I settled in Detroit. I had my family in Detroit. I would go back to Brooklyn to visit my, my mother in Flatbush. And his posters were everywhere, Jewish Defense League and stuff. And I knew he was, you know, he was a Jewish. He was so far right that he, I would call him a Jewish fascist. But in those those days, he was just a small, small group. And I still had hopes for you know, two-state solution. That was what we all, all try to create. So I was aware of Kahana. And then he goes to Israel. And I remember his party being um, uh, outlawed because it's so far right. Well, now Kahana is a big hero. Right. So it was a slow evolution in my thinking and my obs observation of what was going on in Israel. And I remember, you know, learning that the left was that there was hardly any left and um any left left you could say right. and i had a um i had a, a, a dear cousin she was part of uh my four girl cousins who were also in hiding and survived in france one of my cousins uh became an ardent zionist she was recruited by the zionists in france and she made aliyah she went to um to Israel to found the state and she worked on the state in the state uh, for the government actually as an agricultural expert and I would visit her once in a while and contact her and I remember at one point and she was very secular they were all leftists they were all socialists or communists that, that kind of thing um and I remember visiting her and her saying to me Renee this is not uh, the kind of state that we wanted to establish which was they wanted to establish kind of a socialist state, secular, and already the the rabbis and the religious establishment were taking over, and one of her daughters actually left Israel and moved back uh, to Paris. She's still there. Um, um, my 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 cousin uh, Haya, who just just passed away. So I watched the state lose its left wing leanings and becoming more in right wing to to this point where we have these people that are. Pretty openly fascist, I would say. They're called extremists or, or white supremacists or whatever they are. But their action, their behavior, as you can see, to me, it's such a shock what's going on in Gaza, what has gone on, uh, gone on in the name of of, of, the, of the Jewish people. It's it's beyond belief. And as someone who's been as a, a speaker in the Holocaust Center here, and also in the also in the general community I've been invited to speak in schools a lot and I always talk about the uh, at the end uh, you talk about the lessons of the Holocaust and you try to paint a kind of uh, more positive picture as to the lessons uh, you talk about you know lessons have taught me against stereotype against intolerance uh, for you know accepting diversity things like that well and now, never again and never again to, to anyone, because uh, that's what I meant. Of course, the right wing would say never again to the Jews. I mean, they're only interested in their their issues. The thing about the Jewish community, they are the most oppressed. They're, they're the biggest victims, right? There, there's a kind of a hierarchy of victimhood in the Jewish community, especially in the Holocaust and the survivor community who suffered more. So even today, as they're doing these horrible things in Gaza, they see themselves, Israelis, Jews, here in Detroit, they see themselves as victims. Right. And the oppressor is, you know, uh, the typical anti-Semites, whether the Nazis or now they're the Arabs or the Palestinians, and they're not real. They, uh, the, the, the Jewish people do have dehumanized Arabs. They've dehumanized 
In the same way, and I learned this a long time ago, the way that Americans dehumanized the Vietnamese. I remember the period when I, when I was pretty active in the Vietnam, anti-Vietnam movement where uh, the, the, the propaganda that we had here, the media, we dehumanized Vietnamese. They were not human beings, they were gooks. And so for target practice in the military, I remember seeing these, they would have these images of slant-eyed people and they were all the enemies. So that gave permission to our US soldiers to kill uh, children because they were of course carrying grenades uh, and uh, you know justified killing civilians very much exactly the way uh, Jewish troops today, these young kids who know nothing, these soldiers who've been brainwashed, are killing civilians. And this way, this time, it's it's much worse because it's really not one-on-one -on -one contact where you're looking at the at, at the eyes of the civilian you're going to kill. This time, it's from the air, right? A lot of it is just these long-distance murder of of civilians and children. And the alibi is, well, they're using them as uh, human shields, which is just, it's just lies. Uh, and I learned that years ago, little by little, as these uh, various operations by the Israelis against Palestinians have occurred, that, um, you know, there were all these excuses that the military, the Israeli military had. They were using civilians as human shields. And I remember, uh, again, and the terrorists were doing that. And I remember saying, you know, it's really strange. There were all these children who've been killed, who've been uh, used as human shields. But so who, who, if you've killed the terrorists, who, where were all these terrorists, all these terrorists that have been killed? You never see who they are, really, because they're a lot of them are just civilians. But th those are the excuses that, that the Jewish people and the media especially the media in Israel and the media in the United States are put forward. So we don't, Jews do not see Arabs or Palestinians especially uh, as we do dehumanize them. Uh, and I, I could, I mean, I see it as genocide. I, I see it as, as equivalent. You know, it's difficult for me to say that, but it's equivalent to what happened in the Holocaust. Now, you could say the numbers are different. You can get into all these distractions, etc. But in terms of what it's doing and what it's done uh, to, first, the Holocaust, you know, I, I could never, as a speaker, I'm sure these, these speakers like myself, they're being asked at, at the end of their talk at, at, a, at a Holocaust museum or in school, well, you've suffered so much. How do you explain what you've done in Gaza? How do you explain that? all these civilians who've been killed, all these children, and I'm supposed to represent children. You know, I talk a lot about children because a million and a half Jewish children were murdered by the Germans. And how did they do that? The, the one, day, one way it was explained by Himmler, one of the Nazis, why these Germans were killing civilians and, and children, because these German soldiers were having PTSD in those days. They were killing civilians. And we know they were having those issues, emotional issues, because they wrote home letters to their family about that. And they complained to their officers that they were killing <laughs> civilians and they didn't sign up for that. And to the degree where Himmler, second in command in the Nazis, went out in 43 and 44 to the Eastern Front and gave them pep talk. And he said to them, if... Um, it's very difficult for you Germans to be killing civilians. We know that because you're such a caring people. But you have to kill these children because if you don't, they will grow up and be avengers. And that's the terminology he used, avengers. They will seek revenge on you for what you did to their family members. And that's what the Israelis are doing and saying and thinking when they kill Palestinians. It's preventive murder. If we don't kill them now, they will grow up and become uh, av Avengers. And right. so, but what it's doing in practice, of course, it's it's creating recruits for uh, uh, for the uh, what I call the Palestinian resistance. And I've talked about this where I see 
the, uh, the resistance, Hamas, uh, as equivalent to the Jewish ghetto uprising. Uh, I see them as resistance, as maybe not freedom fighters the way we, they were in, in Vietnam, but uh, in the ghetto, uh, in, in, in the Jewish ghetto, the young people, and they were always left wing uh, socialists or communists who organized this resistance. And their thinking was, we're going to be mil murdered, we're going to die, and we want to take some of them with us, which they did. They killed quite a few Germans. And um, Norman Finkelstein talks about that, that these young people in Gaza, which is an open air concentration camp, and he's not the only one that said that. A lot of a lot of political people have said that long before him, that Gaza is an open air concentration camp. You can't get in, you can't get out. These people are born there. They're the second generation from, from the Nakba, that, where they, they were kicked out of Israel. They, they went to Gaza. They were born there. They lived there. They're going to die there. And with that mentality, I could see where young people joining resistance and the resistance would be Hamas. Uh, and, um, and the Nakba, I would say, by the way, it's not like it happened once. It's been, I'm not the only one saying that. Analysts have said that as well. It's continued until today. The Nakba has really, that the Israelis have always, have continued to try to kick out the Palestinians. The Nakba was when about 800,000 Palestinians were uh, during the uh, War of Independence. Um, uh, all these uh, Palestinians left either from their own accord or they were, uh, there was uh, a terrorism against them, their villages, etc. They left thinking they could come back. But of course, once they left, the Israelis, the Zionists, realized we're not going to let them back in. And that, that kind of mentality still continues. So in the West Bank, you have the settlements and uh, where they're still trying to kick out Palestinians. And they want to do the same thing with Gaza. So they have this, uh, uh, you know, the whole land being free of, uh, of Palestinians. So you said that you became critical of Israel after it turned right wing. But from what you're saying right now, the founding of Israel through the Nakba was, I mean, ethnic cleansing, right? So is it that you didn't know about that or you kind of didn't pay attention to it? Were you in denial of it? Yeah, I didn't. Um, I knew, yeah, denial is a big, a, a big, a big, um, a big part. I mean, today, especially, uh, I mean, the, the Israeli people, and I'm, I'm saying this, uh, Gideon Levy is the person you want to listen to on, on, um, yeah. On, the Israeli uh, journalist, yeah. The Israeli journalist who's just really, really... So I've learned a lot through these people that are part of what's called the New uh, the new Historians. Uh, There's about three or four or five of them who have, you know, written these books. Of course, they're they're now called, you know, um, traitors, et cetera, et cetera. Right. They, they've had to leave. They couldn't get work, a lot of them, in Israel. They've, they've gone... Ilan in, in Pape, a, for instance. Pape is one of them, and... Uh, Avi Benny Schlein, Morris used to be one of them, but uh, that's Benny a whole Morris, other story. Exactly, yeah. And uh, Norman Finkelstein, of course, who you know has to uh, we have to recognize in terms of the Israeli lobby, the yeah. Jewish lobby, in terms of its influence on the on U.S., uh, especially the Congress, uh, and um, you, you know po po politicians paying them off all these years and helping to brainwash Jewish children. Uh, a lot of them are Jewish children who. At some point, realized when they went to Israel on these trips. But well, wait a minute, there's all these other people there. Now, fortunately, I was given a tour by friends of mine in Jerusalem of of the West Bank, and these friends of mine that were still there in in uh, Israel in Jerusalem, uh, they're part of these uh, kind of uh, human rights groups where they sit and they observe the border so that. These soldiers don't humiliate. Humiliation is a big part. And the, and the Israeli military learned that from the Nazis as well. The Nazis, the first step the Nazis were going to do was humiliate the Jews by cutting off their beards or making fun of them, etc., etc. And the 
the Israelis do the same thing uh, to the uh, to the Arabs, and so and they do that, for example, at the border. These young uh, soldiers with these guns humiliate Palestinians at the border who are coming into work, etc. So these friends of mine are, are at the border, making sure that 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 doesn't go on, you know. And so uh, this, these friends took me to the West Bank. I saw the conditions, you know, not completely, but I was very aware of, of the, the two worlds. That's uh, apartheid, you know, apartheid. I remember recently, you know, you, well, you couldn't use a word like that. You couldn't use genocide. I said, but in the last, the last three or four months, we've learned that, um, no, it applies. People now use the word genocide, apartheid, uh, ethnic cleansing, all these terms that are part of our vocabulary because even the main media in the United States has been forced to recognize that. Um, and so uh, I, I, little by little, I, I realized what, but I was always hoping for a two-state solution and I still do and I think it's still possible. It's the one, um, and I differ from friends of mine who believe in one state. I, I don't think one state is possible at all. I think it's, it's crazy because there's no trust between these two people. They've been so isolated from each other that they don't trust each other. But if you create two states, and I've been told this by lectures I've gone through in, when I was in Israel, by Mossad people, by Shimbet people, Israeli intelligence people, who have said in these lectures, it's possible. We have boundaries. We've negotiated with them. Uh, we could deal with the question of Jerusalem in terms of how that would be split up. It ain't rocket science, but the leadership of both camps are so uh, wedded to their power and their egos that they're not going to negotiate what you what you need, which is what's being talked about now, is uh, an outside force to bang some heads together of these leaders and pay them off, which is always what people do. I mean, it's called, you know, economic aid or whatever it is. And so these leaders from both camps, Israeli and Palestinian, can go back to their communities and say, well, you know, we, we it wasn't perfect, but, you know, they forced us into it and let's give it a try. You know, that kind of stuff. They would they would kind of blame it on the Americans or whoever's in, I think it would be the international situation, uh, international community that would have to come in and uh, create these two states build some kind of trust, make sure the old people die, all these terrible people that with their ideas, all these fascists. Uh, second generation would be much more open to dialogue. They would have businesses together, you know, then. but build up some trust. And then if they want to have one state, at least they they know each other. They uh, it, it wouldn't be quite... So I think of it as two stages, but... Um, that's my, my my only hope is that the people that are old and and uh, and I learned that from my experiences in Poland, where I saw that happen, where these old anti-Semitic people, uh, religious in Poland, you know, where they get anti-Semitic sermons every week because the Jews killed Jesus in Polish churches. Polish are very religious, uh, but the young people are not in Poland. And they're very attracted to this idea of who are these Jews. And they, I've seen these, these young people do things. And then I've met the same ones in Jerusalem where they've you know, gone into academia and, and doing research about the real history of Poland in terms of their relationship to Jews. And um, so that's why I think when there's a generation shift, the young people would have a much more open attitude towards seeing each other as human beings and, you know, doing work together and things like that. I saw it in Paris during some of these riots against Jews when, when Israel was doing stuff. And there, were the, and I, there were these neighborhoods that were kind of working class neighborhoods in Paris where these people who were Jewish and, and Arabs who had businesses together. And, you know, I have photographs of them. People can get along if you don't have these uh, people, you know, whipping up hatred and... Uh, Today, you've got the extreme right wing in, in Israel who want to, I mean, Bibi is considered a centrist, believe it or not, Netanyahu, compared right. to these, yeah. 
And what do you think of the way that um, the terms anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism have been kind of conflated? Right. So I learned that quite a few years ago as well, when I was living in, in Europe and and um, and the, the, the Israelis, uh, the IDF were, were doing these uh, these ethnic mowing the lawn. That's right, as I call uh, it. Yeah. Yeah, where they go in and uh, the Israeli, uh, the IDF, and kill off the the leadership and the children. They the snipers, these snipers who shoot these children in the back because the children have thrown some rocks, you know. And I I observed all that, and um, and then I noticed the term anti-Semitism was used all the time, and I, I thought to myself, this is not anti-Semitism. This is uh, uh, we are the in the diaspora, we're collateral damage. We are, we are the, the, the anti, what's called the anti-Semitism is really the local population, like in France, it's the North, North African population, you know, going after the Jews uh, indiscriminately um, because of what's going on in, in the Middle East. They can't go there and fight back, so they take out their anger against local Jews. And, and, and I, I could understand that. Of course, I... I'd rather it, it wouldn't happen, but I could understand that they were really, really upset. And then I realized that uh, this term anti-Semitic, they weren't anti-Jewish, they were anti-Israeli. They were anti-Israeli behavior. And then when, when Israel stopped doing that, of course, those types of things didn't go on in Europe anymore. And then I remember reading about different Jewish communities in Europe, the diaspora again, because there's a big difference between the diaspora Jewry and Israelis, um, Israelis don't care about the diaspora, you know, in terms of what's called anti-Semitism. But a lot of other communities in Europe will be writing letters uh, to Israel saying, look, you know, our local people, this is where this collateral damage terminology comes in, our local people are catching hell because of what you guys did. You know, there's this so-called anti-Semitism against local Jews because of what you did. And uh, we're, you know, we don't really have anything to do or say about that. Maybe you should warn us if you're going to do that, because, you know, we might participate in these discussions. But the Israeli government couldn't care less. They they only care about, you know, Jewish money. And so the term anti-Semitism, at some point, I realized it's being conflated with anti-Zionism or anti-Israel uh, actions. And now it's got to the point. Now with the uh, International Holocaust uh, Association or something, it's a, it's a new group uh, who are consciously, they've rewritten the definition of anti-Semitism where they actually conflate those two terms and say that anti-Zionism or anti-Israel uh, actions or you know insults or whatever it is, uh, is considered anti-Semitism. Well, I don't think it is. It's not anti-Jewish, it's anti-state. Uh, anti-Israeli state actions, behavior, and when the be when the state becomes um, the way it is in Gaza, and then I, I said you're whipping up real anti-Jewish. It's going to happen in campuses. It's the, that people are going to take it out on the local Jews. Don't be surprised. And so what we've had in the last few months suddenly is this rise in so-called anti-Semitism. And all these Jewish organizations that I call professional Jews because they make money off being Jews. I mean, they lead Jewish organizations. That's where they get their paycheck from. And the term anti-Semitism is a great fundraising tool. And these Jews are already scared to death, especially survivors. And they believe they're being attacked because they're Jews. No, no, no. They're being attacked because the state of Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. That's why they're being attacked. And pretending to represent all Jews and speak for all That's Jews. That's right. That's right. They And they don't. They couldn't care less. And what, what's happening for years, because I've been involved in education, and I've, been, I've created these uh, Holocaust education committees, etc. Um, and it's always been the same, that these Jewish kids go off to college, and they meet these Arab-Palestinian kids at these, like they have these tables, you know, where they'll have an educational point. And these Arab kids are, are saying, look what you guys are doing to our people back there. 
these Jewish kids don't know how to respond. And so the Jewish community consciously has had to train these Jewish kids how to respond to these questions that the Arab kids are raising about you're killing civilians, you're killing children. How do you explain that? So they're having these discussions. Now these discussions by the Jewish leadership are considered anti-Semitic. Right. They're considered anti-Semitic, but they're just having dialogue. So everything becomes anti-Semitism to the degree where, it, to me, it ceases to uh, have any meaning. But these, this organization, the IHAV, I think it's called, uh, are going around state by state, making sure that the state has a law. Now, this is the help with APAC. Now, APAC comes in. IHRA, lobby. the IHRA, yeah. That, that's what you're talking about. The Say international again? IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Exactly. Yeah, and exactly. they have a working a working definition of anti-Semitism, the IHRA exactly. definition, yeah. Right, and you should look up that, that. It's just incredible. It's the only country in the world where you're not allowed to say anything without being called a name. Nobody likes to be called an anti-Semite right. or you know a racist, uh, but uh, that's what they're doing, and they're making it into law. Uh, there's about I don't know how I'm many states, to, yeah. United states that have that have signed that. So these Jewish kids had to be trained in order to answer some of these things in these dialogues. But the dialogues, according to Jewish organizations, the professionals, the leadership, um, uh, they uh, they have to train them. And, and they, again, you know, the def anti-Semitism, it's, it's, I mean, I don't know how much mail I get from these organizations trying to raise money. And, and the letter would be with, you know, anti-Semitism is on the rise on the envelope. I mean, yeah. me coming from Europe, that would have been if, you, if it's really anti-Semitism going on. You wouldn't uh, any, anyway. Uh, that's I, that's the terminology. So when you hear the word, you really have to think: How much does this have to do with Israel actions? And then also, like the a ADL considers um, Jewish Voice for Peace a hate group. So their protests would be considered, I'm sure, anti-Semitic, even though it's, I mean, absurd because it's a bunch of Jewish anti-Zionists. But here's, by the way, a photo of you, uh, speaking of Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, with a Jewish Voice for Peace sign says, Jews and allies say never again for anyone. Um, and here's the video of you uh, shutting down uh, traffic. Lying down. Not another nickel! Not another dime! No more money for Israel! Not another nickel! Not another nickel! Not another dime! Not another nickel! Not another dime! No more money for Israel! Yeah, that's me on the ground, and then my, my friend Nabil joined me. Uh, and we were there for you know a few minutes at the intersection right next to the Holocaust Museum. We want to know what the Holocaust Museum has to say about Gaza. I mean, they've got, of right. course, and they help indoctrinate the population about Jewish suffering, etc. And that's correct, Jewish suffering. But now they have to deal with, in the same way, the Rwandan genocide. They dealt with that. You know, right. what are they going to say about Gaza? What do they say about the um, the Nakba? The more we learn about the Nakba, how do they describe it? Uh, those are you know, those are pretty important. So we had a, a demonstration in front of the Holocaust Museum, and then we walked over to this large intersection, and I, I carried a white uh, flag because, we, because if you remember, there were these, um, there were I think they were Israelis, or but they carried a white flag, and they were shot by the Yeah, Israelis. three of the hostages, the, the three yeah. hostages who were carried white yes. flags and were speaking exactly. in Hebrew, and they shot things. Exactly. Yeah. And they were killed. They were killed. Yeah, they were because, killed, yeah. You know, long distance. They shoot anything that moves. Right. That, and the, the snipers, the snipers who are, you know, considered, you know, we have movies in from Hollywood about snipers and how how they're looked up to. So, right. anyway, Hollywood is an, an interesting place because it's got both liberals and, and very right-wing people. And, um, you know, a lot of the money um, comes, that goes into supporting all this right-wing stuff comes from U.S. Uh, billionaires like Adelson, who makes his, made his money in Las Vegas, yeah. and APAC, which is another story, but that 
people should look up APAC, which is considered a, um, and also Canary Mission. Canary oh, yeah. Mission is extremely important very much under the radar, but they they destroy the lives of these young people who oppose genocide, and they keep doing that. So they give you a mark. So years from now, you go out and try to get a job, and people say, "But by the way, we just checked your background, and you were kind of a troublemaker, and you're an you're, anti-Semite, you're an anti-Semite, etc." Or self-loathing Jew, yeah. Well, exactly. So. That's Canary Mission. Um, it's a, a very nasty picture and uh, yeah. And I just wanted to ask you, and w I would love to have you back on because you have so much um, w insight and wisdom. But um, for my, my final question for this interview is, what is the connection between Never Again and what is happening now in Gaza? And why is it that more people don't make the connection between what happened to the Jews and the Holocaust and what's happening to Palestinians today. Why do you think you're able to see that, but so many people aren't? Well, the media has a lot to do with it. Um, the Jewish leadership, I mean, just think of it. You know, we got rabbis all over the world. Now, do the rabbis ever talk of, about that? In what kind of language do they use? No. And I know this from personally because I've been through you know, a bunch of synagogues uh, over my lifetime with my kids uh, to, until today, you know, where I, I th there was a very, very liberal um, congregation where, you know, the, I thought the rabbi was very liberal and then it turned out to, you know, at one point there were these calls for, we stand for Israel during what Hamas did, right? So what Hamas did was boy, was seized upon by the, the right-wing leadership in this country, in the United States, as uh, uh, these are savages. It was used to paint the Palestinians as savages. And this is language that they use, animals. Yeah, they cut off the breast of uh, women. Yeah. They killed children. They rape women. All of these lies, they've been right. shown to be lies, but they've hit the media and American media, which is sold, bought off by the corporation. It's called the corporate media for a reason. Um, it's bought off, and, and a, a lot of it by the APAC crowd. ADL is part of uh, the, the, the Jewish lobby and the, the, all of these other billionaires. And so the, a lot of the population in the United States is completely ignorant, especially the Jewish community, the Jewish newspapers. You know, I, I read some of that, that press. But the rabbis notice they, they never. There's not a. There's a few voices that that speak up and talk about Jewish values. Now I have to say, Jewish values are the ones that influenced me in in my you know so-called left wing. But also you know other voices, Catholic worker, you know Dorothy Day, people like that, those social revo Christian social revolutionaries and stuff like that. So. Uh, the, the, the rabbis don't say anything. And if you do say something, whether it's, you know, Cornell West or um, uh, uh, Chris, uh, some of these other voices, you Chris get Hedges. Chris Hedges, Norm Finkelstein, you get destroyed. You get right. destroyed in terms of your career, your job, your family. You can't do anything. I, I call it Jewish McCarthyism. Mm. If you know anything about McCarthyism, and I knew people who were the subjects of McCarthyism, you know, who, who were blacklisted, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I knew people with, you know, John Garfield and that family in New York and other Zero Mostel. And um, so that had a big influence. So I, I consider this Jewish McCarthyism where you speak up. And in my case, I can say that because of my age. And the fact that I'm retired, and you know, so I don't care anymore. But you know, when I when my last rabbi stood up and he said, "I stand for Israel," I just got so, which is very recent. Before that, he was standing up for Rashida Talib. Suddenly, he changed his tune. Wow. I stand for Israel. When when all the rabbis were being pressured in Detroit to stand up for Israel, that's it. That was the litmus test. If you didn't, you're going to catch hell. 
That means your congregation, the people that give money to your, con it's a money issue. It's your, your fundraisers locally. They would be, they would leave. Your, your congregation would, would splinter. I experienced that when Trump was, um, was, uh, was elected. I belonged to a conservative synagogue at that time. And uh, I, I realized that half of my friends who were socially uh, progressive on the question of Palestine, they weren't so progressive. Yeah, there's a, there's a term for that. It's called PEP, progressive except on Palestine. Exactly, progressive yeah. except on Palestine. And when I realized that these friends were, you know, pretty right wing and pro Trump and and you know pro Israel, I left that congregation because I realized that the rabbi would never say in the next year or four years would never say anything um, hostile to the present um, our government. So uh, you know it, it leaves you kind of alone. Uh, but you know that's the price. There's been other. People, you know, my role models again. I'm. I feel like part of the. Um, there's an international community of people that believe in social justice, and I was. I was getting. I was starting to talk about where my values come from. They come from doing uh, learning about the Old Testament, about the Jewish tradition. Right. I always learn about. You know, you you care for the justice, justice, justice. You shall Tikkun see. Tikkun olam. Tikkun olam, and you you care about the widow and the orphan and the homeless. Those are the values that I believe in. Now, those are not the values of the right wing in Israel. As a matter of fact, the right wing, and there are some rabbis who've written about that, I, I, who who are very right wing, and they, and they say all this tikkun olam is, is baloney. They believe that, you know, the, the Jews belong on this land and nobody else does. And, uh, you know, we're, again, we're the most oppressed and Therefore, because of the Holocaust, we've been so oppressed that we can do anything and the world will not criticize us so that when you think of European countries, they have such guilt still, including the Germans, about what they did, that they will not say a word against the Israeli leadership. Right. And they make Palestinians, though, pay, the, pay for their crimes. The Germans do. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. They... they, they, they they're able to, you know, kind of transfer that guilt. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I think the issue today, I remember there was a period a couple of years ago where in, in Europe, um, the, the, suddenly the Jewish community was not being atta attacked as a scapegoat for various issues, but it was the, the uh, immigrants, these yeah. Muslim Arab immigrants that were the enemy and that's still the situation. The enemy, the in in Europe, is uh, the foreigner, and that means the dark-skinned people, you know, or uh, and uh, you know, Africans, North Africans, etc. And so things have have changed uh, in Europe. But uh, you know, that's anti-foreign sentiment and and right-wing uh, e equivalent. Uh, Israel right-wingers have allies in France and Italy, where they're also right-wing, also. Uh, fascistic in terms of their views. Yeah, yeah. that's just side. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Renee, for joining, and we'd love to have you back. Thank you. Anytime. Uh, yeah. As things develop, I mean, it's not this, uh, we're going through a period of change. Hopefully they can, um, anyway, I, 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 it's hard to predict anything. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Speak soon. That was great. Um, so insightful. So grateful to Renee for giving us uh, his time and definitely want to have him back on because there's so much we can learn from him. If you haven't already liked this. Oh, and also we'll show you next time. He does really cool art. We can cut in some art later on. We have great. Uh, he does really cool geometrical art. Um, so if you haven't already, please do like the stream. And thank you so much for your generous uh, super chat, Wade Worth. Always appreciate that. Thanks so much, everyone to, who subscribed. And because of you, we're at over 200,000 subscribers, which is great. Um, we're going to bring on our next two guests. Um, very excited to be bringing back to the show Layla Saliba, who is a Palestinian-American graduate uh, student at Columbia University. She's studying 
social work with a concentration in policy practice. And she is passionate about disability justice and wants to make healthcare more accessible and affordable for everyone. She was sprayed with a chemical uh, back in January at Columbia University by someone that she thinks was an IDF volunteer. And we're going to get an update uh, from Layla about what Columbia has done about that attack. We're also being joined making their Katie Helper Show debut by Aiden, who is a queer non-binary MSW student at Columbia University, Masters of Social Work student at Columbia University, a Washington, D.C. native. Social justice has always been embedded in their life. They grew up in a household with two strong parents who imbued upon them the principles of challenging the status quo that perpetuates the subversion of marginalized communities. Um, currently, Aiden is being targeted for their fierce stance against genocide and forced displacement. So welcome, Layla and Aiden. Thank you so much for having us here. It's so good to be back. Of course. So tell us what is happening right now on Columbia's campus. I mean, it, Layla, we'll get an update from you. Maybe mm -hmm. we should start there, just giving us an update on what, if anything, has happened about the chemical attack to which you were subjected. And then we'll talk to you, Aiden, about what is happening to you right now. Yeah. Oh, man, where do I begin? It's, it's, it's crazy what's been going on with us. But so my name is Layla. I was one of the students that was sprayed with the chemical weapon. And Columbia hasn't really done much of anything. They still haven't sent out a campus-wide email letting people know on campus that this has happened. They've tried to shove this under the rug as much as possible. Um, they have not offered financial help for students that were impacted by the by the chemicals like I had to throw away tons of clothes my nice north face coat that I got from Goodwill I was so excited I had to throw it away um I had to throw away my nice boots all that like that costs money and I'm a grad student I'm look I, I don't have a huge budget and that's something that other students are dealing with too and Columbia has not helped them instead what they've done is they've cracked down on freedom of speech and freedom of, of expression in the name of student safety, but it's not actually keeping students safe. Like they have this um, new policy where with the designated demonstration zone. So it's like you can only protest in this certain area on campus. And I'm like, well, we were attacked on campus. So having a special zone for us to go protest, that doesn't make sense. Also, they want students to register protests days in advance. And the reality is that it is a genocide people are dying and people are not always going to have the foresight or the forewarning to register a protest days in advance. It also takes away from the whole spirit of a protest. The whole point of a protest is to be disruptive and to challenge the status quo. And Columbia University is a university that markets itself on challenging the status quo. It has a nickname known as the activist IV. They um, regularly promote, like I know in CSSW, like they promote social justice to us like constantly. And um, they talk about the um, 1968, the anti-Vietnam um, War protests. They talk about those in marketing and to students all the time. But then when it comes to students actually living out the values, the values that they apply to school for, such as social justice, freedom of expression, et cetera, Columbia really clamps down on it. And it's a really severe type of repression, unlike anything that I've ever seen before, unlike anything that a lot of people in academia have seen before. Um, like they, for example, they've been monitoring print jobs that say Palestine. Yeah, which is crazy because it's like, it's our money. If we wanna print something related to Palestine, we should be able to do that. There's that. They've also been um, surveilling campus Wi-Fi networks. They've been surveilling um, student emails. Um, they've been using facial recognition technology slash AI to identify students at protests. Um, and that's really concerning. None of that actually keeps students safe. It just makes students scared to speak out. And also something too is you can kind of see Columbia, like they claim to care about student safety, but it's like when we were attacked with the chemical weapons, we didn't get a private investigator 
going and knocking and figuring out and figuring out what happened. We were, we were literally sitting there. I was sitting there having to like identify all this stuff myself while I was sick because the university did not believe me. Like with Aiden, they had, um, with Aiden, with other students, they had a private investigator, like come and knock on people's door and like scare them. So I'm like, okay, you can do that for an event, a teach-in, but you can't do that when we're attacked with chemical weapons. That's, that's hypocritical. Yeah. And people are really frustrated with the administration. They don't trust the administration at all. And I think why admin is also cracking down on us is because they know that Columbia students are influential. The current um, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, he's a Columbia alum. And um, donors and trustees are really, really upset with how much Columbia students are supporting Palestine. So they think that if they can just like clamp down on us and suppress us, that that will get us to stop supporting Palestine. And I think if anything, it's it's done the opposite. Like it's let it's really shown the true colors of admin. It's shown how the university does not care, does not prioritize students. And it's also shown too how powerful our speech is. If what we were saying did not matter, then the university would not try to um, place limits on it. Right. They're threatened by it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? I know that was a lot. I think you said an amazing job. Um, Thanks. Katie, if you have any questions, I'm. Yeah, definitely. I actually, I'm going to read um, a, uh, a statement. You just texted me something. Where does that come from? Because it does a really good job of laying out what happened in a way that doesn't um, get anyone into any legal trouble. Yeah, so that's um, directly from joint SJP and uh, CU AD, um, Columbia University Apartheid Divest. Okay, great. So let me show you this statement. And of course, SJP has been, is it still banned? Yes. They're still so banned. Students for Justice in Palestine has been banned by Columbia University, right? This is supposed mm -hmm. to be a place of free speech mm -hmm. and thriving ideas. Uh, and what about uh, Jewish Voices for Peace? Is that still banned? Also banned. banned. Okay. I mean, it is so outrageous. I don't, I'm like smiling because I can't, you, you kind of can't make this what? up. And all the people who talk about cancel culture, where are they? Why aren't they up in arms about this? Two organizations have been banned by mm -hmm. university. So let me just um, uh, share this uh, this statement that it gives some good background. On April 4th, Columbia suspended five pro-Palestine students and ordered them to be evicted from their Columbia housing with only 24 hours notice. This happened after Columbia hired ex-cops in an attempt to violate students' rights and interrogate them without lawyers present. We are asking our community members to let the university know that we are paying attention and we find their conduct outrageous. We demand that Columbia immediately revoke these violent eviction and suspension orders and stop targeting pro-Palestine uh, students. So Aiden, tell us what you experienced. Yeah, so I was one of the fortunate five to had the private investigators come to my door. Um, and I spoke with them on Monday night and um, was in the middle of meeting myself, so wasn't able to actually speak to them longer. Um, I informed them that I would not want to speak to them without a lawyer present. Mm -hmm. um, they informed me that night that I was not under investigation, but however, my participation in the process was mandatory, and if I refused, it would be reported to Columbia. The next morning I woke up um, to an email at 7.30 in the morning from this new, the COO of Columbia, mm -hmm. stating that I need to report to public safety or speak to them by five o'clock that day. Otherwise I'd be placed on immediate disciplinary action, um, which we later came to find out was interim suspension. Mm -hmm. um, clear violation of my constitutional rights. Come to find out numerous students also received that um, threatening email. Um, immediately I, I spoke to counsel, legal counsel and um, was advised that yes, this was a violation of my rights to, um, again, self-incrimination and um, legal counsel. And then as the days progressed, there were negotiations about times that when we could come in or not. Um, about five o'clock on Wednesday night, um, we were notified that we needed to appear by six o'clock or we place on, would be placed on interim suspension. I was in the Bronx at my sister's house, not physically able to show up. Um, but quite frankly, I refuse to participate in any sort of process that violates constitutional rights, um, not only just for myself and not only for the other people involved in this situation, but I want to set a precedent that Colombia cannot keep using and exerting its power over us 
um, to get what they want um, mm -hmm. to and and by doing so violating the law, um, moral and ethical standards. Um, and so as part of the interim suspension, I'm not allowed on campus property, which includes my Columbia housing. Um, I was notified at 743 on Wednesday night that I had an 24 hours to leave my home, uh, that I was not permitted in my home anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially 24 hours later, we started eviction defense. Uh, we've had uh, anywhere between 60 to 80 people a day pull up in defense um, of my apartment and somebody else in my building who's also suspended her apartment as well. Um, just here to show that the community wants us here, um, but that also Columbia, if they wanna go forward with an eviction, has to follow the legal procedures. 24 hours is nowhere near the legal procedures. Mm -hmm. um, and Columbia is fragrantly breaking the law and violating our rights without any sort of remorse, without any sort of signs of stopping. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, long story short that's where we've where, where we're at right now where this is a part of eviction defense so thank mm -hmm. you for joining us for eviction defense yeah of course and we'll put in links and um email addresses and stuff for people to to contact but you know something that's interesting is that there's obviously they're just kind of like right-wing zionists um who are pressuring columbia to to crack down on dissent but uh, I also saw floating around, there's this leaked uh, email that was sent by a professor to a um, CSSW student, so that's Columbia mm -hmm. School of Social Work student, right? Yes. Um, asking them to remove a fl Palestinian flag emoji, but I just want to share it because it's such a weaponization of, um, it's such woke washing mm -hmm. of racism. They're hiding behind like language of inclusivity. So let me just share this because it's kind of a trip. Um, so here's the leaked email. Thanks for reaching back out and bringing this. Uh, okay, on it, th that's irrelevant. I don't know what that is, but here's the relevant part. It has recently been brought to my attention that geopolitical emojis used at the end of name info has caused trauma reactions, making it difficult for some to remain present and not dissociate during class session. I know that as the semester started, there were more folks who included the image um, along their name, but that number has dwindled and yours was the only one I saw during our last session. I'm asking for your continued partnership in ensuring our class space remains a safe one for all to actively learn and keep any images and or contributions relevant to course content. So what, what do you guys think about that? It sounds exactly like the experience that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that I'm very fortunate to have some great professors and, and community members. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely um, a small group of people that are controlling the narrative at Columbia mm -hmm. and, and CSSW as well. Um, I really like how you said woke washing. Uh, I think that accurately describes our program in general. Yeah, We're taught to be, um, we're taught that we're, engaging in non-racist or anti-racist social work mm -hmm. um, when in reality, reality it's just teaching people how to hide their racism um, how to hide their biases um, through this guise of trauma-informed care um, and the unfortunate unfortunate reality that we have we've tried to bring palestine into the curriculum this has been a demand since our sit-in in november and we, we've been consistently ignored mm -hmm. um, meetings have been canceled rooms have been canceled um, so I think this is an accurate re representation, though minute, an accurate representation of what our experience is at CSSW. I will yeah. say um, the term geopolitical emojis, like it just makes me laugh because it just seems so ridiculous. Yeah, it really. And also too, it's like talking about Palestine is inherently seen as controversial or political, especially at Columbia. But it's like when it came to, for example, supporting Ukraine, People had no issue with supporting Ukraine, but suddenly yeah. when you say Gaza or you say the word Palestine, it's controversial. Like it should not be controversial to be against bombing children. Yet we are constantly made to feel, especially Palestinian students, I am constantly made to feel like a walking national security threat. And it's like, I am a nice person. Like I rescue birds. I literally got put on Canary Mission the other day for like, oh, right. Like, you know. <laughs> it's a badge <laughs> of honor. Honestly, at this point, yeah. But yeah, a lot of times, like these administrators at Columbia, they will talk all this, 
all this talk about uh, doing the right thing and and socially socially just practice but then when it comes to actually walking the walk and putting those values that you claim to care about into action it's silence and the silence is noticeable it's very noticeable it's very apparent and it's hypocritical and frankly we're sick of it and we deserve better other students deserve better like to be treated so badly at a university it's like we me me and you like we've both worked hard to get here and mm -hmm. this has been such a frustrating experience granted i've had a lot of really wonderful like there are good faculty members at cssw who've really helped me out and really been there on my side but just i would say the level of cruelty and violence from Columbia University administration is unlike anything I've ever seen before. Like they are making students homeless and they see no issue with it. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's sickening. This school is operating more like a hedge fund or a private equity firm instead of an institution with students. Yeah, I would just add to that is that this is, I think we can both agree that there's amazing people at our school. Mm -hmm. I, two amazing people right here, I'd like to yeah. say. Um, I think it's, it just shows that this is a systemic issue and an institutional mm -hmm. issue versus interpersonal, though that does happen. Um, there are definitely a lot of people that have tried to go at bat for us, or me mm -hmm. specifically, um, during the past week that have been shut down just due to the power that Columbia administration has. And um, it's very evident um, what they're willing to do. And, and in this case, sacrifice my, my housing, my food, and my medical care security in order to promote their own agenda. And Layla, uh, shifting gears a little bit, I know you have family in Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us an update about how they are? Yes, so we are working on evacuating my surviving family members. We managed to raise money for them, which I'm very excited about. Um, the reason why we had to raise money is so the Egyptian government, if you want to cross over the Rafah border, you have to pay a bribe to the Egyptian authorities. Otherwise, they will not let you cross. And so it's at least 5K um, per person. Sometimes it's 10K. And so if you don't have family in the area or money on your own, you're left out of luck. But really, really like the community at Columbia has like really, really come through for me. Like a professor, I didn't even know she donated $2,000 wow. to the GoFundMe. And that just, that, that, that was just truly incredible to see. Like the administration might suck, but like we are here for each other and that's what matters. And also too is like, if y'all could just pray for my family, like I'm, I'm nervous about them. Um, I have a really big target on my back. Um, I've had a lot of people go after me. I've been placed on sites like Canary Mission. Um, and I'm worried for the safety of my family. So you mean really, here or in Palestine? Yes, in Palestine, okay. in Palestine. Yeah. Um, and where are they now, the family that hasn't been evacuated? So they're um, they're sheltering. So they're sheltering at a church. I can't give the specific yeah, location for safety, but... Yeah, it's just been stressful too. So there's a telecommunications blackout in Gaza right now. So unfortunately, like I, I'm the type, I would love to get updates like every day, multiple updates per day personally, but it's like updates are kind of few and far between. And that also adds to the stress of the situation. Yeah. Um, what is happening by the way, and I'm sorry for that, by the way, and sending your, your you and your family are in my thoughts. Thank you. Um, what is uh, the situation with my favorite Columbia professor, Shai Davidai, who is, for people who don't know, he's this totally histrionic um, uh, Zionist uh, social media addict who presents himself as a constant victim and gives these ridiculous speeches and at the same time is constantly doxing people, trying to get them in trouble, snitching on them. Uh, what is he up to these days? Um, I know you have important news to share, but I want to highlight that he was at an unauthorized protest on Thursday. Um, Uh-oh. Hello, Columbia. Hello, yeah. <laughs> administration. But Layla does have a great update to share. So um, some students have launched a petition to take action against him. I'm going to send that um, to you so you can share it. 
Good. But um, yeah, it's been challenging to deal with. Um, he's gone after me multiple times. Um, I have him blocked. I have his wife blocked. He probably follows me with like several burner accounts. He's probably watching this right now, which if you are, hey, shy. Hey, um, shy. Hey, shy. How's it going? How's it going? Um, but yeah, it's just, it's honestly really creepy. Like this man is, I think he's in his 40s. I'm not, I'm not even sure. But um, like he has my post notifications on. Like 52 oh, seconds yeah. after. Sorry, I was getting re video ready. Sorry, say that again. Sure. This man like has his post notifications on for me. Like he is, he he watches what I do more than like my own parents, which is honestly kind of, which is honestly creepy. And um, it's honestly frustrating that Columbia hasn't really done anything about it. So that's why we're taking this public. We're just like, you can't, you can't treat students like this. I mean, I, I even told him, I was like, please leave me alone. Like, I lost family members. Like, please leave me alone. Um, and yeah, like he has need to harass me. And his wife is getting in on this, too? Yes, his wife is in on it, too. What does she do? Um, so she promotes, like, tweets, links, um, whatever, to different WhatsApp groups and um, says that we are being anti-Semitic, that we are Jew haters. And I've always, like, I'm, I was like, how, how are you, where are you getting that from? Like what's going on here? Um, she also posts our stuff um, in different Facebook groups. She goes around and she defends him. So it's not just him. It's like, a, right. it's like a duo. Wow. That's really gross. Well mm -hmm. here, um, stop Arab hate posted a video of Davidai. Um, but also someone named David Letterer, who's a student at Columbia. Uh, do you know who that person is? Uh, there's a video of him with Shai Davidai and he's calling pro-Palestinian students terrorists. Yeah. But There's a good I, group of them that do that. Yeah, right. You probably can't keep track, right? But I thought this was interesting because I'm going to show this because um, here they are and you're going to see Shai Davidai who talks about how unsafe he feels, right? And how um, scared he is to be on campus and how much anti-Semitism and hate there is. And tell me if you think he looks very scared in this video. One second. Um, share screen. Okay. He's not the one with the megaphone, but you'll see him. He, he throws up a peace sign. That's shy. Look at how scared he looks on this on this campus full of anti-Semitism and and hate. And he can, you know, he talks about how he's targeted. Anyway, well, that's uh, that's 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 what it's like living in such a hateful environment that you're smiling while throwing the peace sign up. He doesn't look very like uh, afraid. Looks like we lost you. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know why this happened last week too. I pressed something and went away. Um, sorry about that. Thanks, Bradford. Uh, as I was saying, yes, he doesn't look like he's afraid for his life. It looks like he's having a fine time. Yeah, he was at that protest. He was actually like going up and harassing people too, like going up and being like, um what was it calling people terrorist supporters and just all kinds of stuff. But really it's like, I don't want to give him any more attention. I know. Right. I feel He's like so he, annoying, but yeah, he, you're right. He loves the attention. He does really, love the attention. Doing, it, yeah. Really what we're doing is for the people of Palestine yeah. and to end the genocide that's going on in Gaza, people can say what they want to say, but at the end of the day, we know that we're doing the right thing and that's what matters. Yeah. Uh, firmware says uh, they're panicking. It's a good sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sprinkle gave it. Thank you for that donation. Um, and Billy Clifton says, like Renee, the first guest, I protested Vietnam War. I have great love for the activists today supporting Palestine. So, 
That's so sweet. Mm -hmm. What you pointed out, Layla, by the way, is so right on, though. Like, imagine someone telling someone to take out their a Ukraine flag emoji mm -hmm. from their name. It would never in a million years happen. Ever. It wouldn't happen. No. Yeah. yeah, I think it also speaks to the to the influences and the the political and financial investments that Colombia has in at in Israel. Oh but yeah, I, can you guys can you guys talk about that? Yeah, um, so we have a saying that it's very much like the U.S. When Israel bombs, Colombia pays. Mm -hmm. um, Colombia is funding this genocide, just like the Greater United States is funding this genocide in Gaza right now. And so any attack on or what they perceive as an attack mm -hmm. on Israel or Zionism. Is therefore an attack on Colombia's interests, um, financial and political interests. So I, I think that plays in a big part into why Colombia is trying so hard to silence us and repress mm -hmm. us, is because they know that we see right through them. Mm -hmm. We know we see where their investments are. Um, for example, in the they're building a whole global center, and have a dual degree with the Tel Aviv Global Center. Um, that's also directly linked to the displacement of Black and Brown people in Harlem. Mm -hmm. and Manhattanville. Um, so Colombia extends worldwide in just domination and just complete disregard for marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we're waking up. Um, the students have been woken up. Mm -hmm. I think we're waking up the communities um, to people that haven't necessarily seen this before. We're also getting in touch and in coalition with community members that have been fighting this for a while. And I think it's scaring them. And Absolutely. Quite frankly, like they should be afraid of the collective power and, and their ability to make change mm -hmm. um, and advocate for a more just society. Mm. And uh, Layla, were you going to add something? Yeah. Or, I have well, another question, but you respond to that first. Yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to add um, a big reason why we're pushing divestment too is because so Colombia has a massive endowment. And for anybody who doesn't know, endowment is just like, um, resources or stocks investments that a company or college manages. Columbia's endowment is $12 billion, over $12 billion. It's one of the largest in the country. And that endowment is being funded by our tuition dollars. It's also being funded towards causes and companies that we do not agree with. For example, um, Columbia has investments in Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is one of the biggest manu weapons manufacturers for the genocide that is going on with Gaza in Gaza. And as a student, I don't want my tuition dollars, I don't want, want my tuition dollars going towards bombing Palis Palestinians. And also too, is Colombia has a legacy of divestment. Colombia was one of the um, first schools in the country to divest from private prisons. They've been one of the mm -hmm. first schools in the country to divest from South African apartheid. We've divested before and we'll do it again. Great. And since, as you, you just said, Layla, when I was kind of, um, mocking uh shy davidai that this is really about palestinians so i just wanted to give you the last word to tell us about what your family in palestine has experienced and what they've told you about their experience or let us know anything that you know from your family that you want this audience to know about yeah so i know that a lot of people have seen different images coming out of palestine there's been a lot of really gruesome images especially with the um al shifa hospital massacre. But the reality is that pictures do not do it justice. It is so much worse than you can imagine. Um, the air smells like dead bodies. There are dead bodies everywhere you go. And it's something that is, it's something that's heartbreaking to witness. And I also think too, it's like, we all have a moral obligation to speak up against this. Over 33,000 Palestinians are dead. And that is estimated to be a severe undercount. That yeah. doesn't account for the over 100,000 Palestinians that have been injured. That doesn't account for the thousands that are trapped under the rubble or the millions that are displaced. This and trapped under the rubble. And also, um, I mean, the fact that they can't get them out because yeah. they don't have the equipment to do it because the fuel isn't let in. I mean, it's just like atrocity it, on top of atrocity. Yes. Like they're literally, they're digging, like they don't, people are digging with their, hands. with their hands. It's awful. And it's like, nobody should ever have to live like this. I don't want anybody to have to live like this. And really like, if you have not 
spoken out about Palestine if you have not um, donated to organizations like the Palestine Children's Relief Fund or um, UNRWA. Now is your time. Um, we really do need all the support that we can get. And just your support, it means a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you guys, both of you so much. Any final words? Really appreciate you coming on. No, I just want to say thank you for talking about this, giving us a platform mm -hmm. to speak about our experiences are at Columbia and how we can connect it to a larger scale in, in Gaza as well. So thank you. Right. Thank you. And we will put those links in the, in the description. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Well, that was great. What a great show. Um, shame on Columbia. We'll put the links in the description so people can email Columbia. And thank you all, of course, uh, as usual, for joining. Thanks, everyone, for helping us get to over 200,000. And I got to thank, of course, Bradley Bloom for helping that happen. Tyler for helping that happen. Fanta Miss Fanta for helping that happen. Someone put a nice comment about you, Brad, in the in the comments I want to show. It was like, I really appreciate Brad and the part he plays in the stream. So well, I appreciate you screenshot it. I appreciate that person. Yeah. If you could screenshot that and we could maybe put that on a plaque, have that behind. I actually you. do have it screenshot. I thought maybe it would, I would lose it. Yeah, so here we no, go. Hold yeah, on. We need we need to frame that. It make it part of your background. Let's see. Share screen. Here we go. Just so you don't think I'm making it up, everyone. There you go. Oh, man. Thank you very much, David Cade. I, I appreciate that very much. Yeah. I, I do. Well, and I, and I appreciate everyone here as well. Uh, really, I, I'm very appreciative of, in my opinion, having one of the best audiences in chat uh, yes. sections. Um, yeah. Very, yeah. Very, very lucky. And yeah. some of the greatest guests and conversations. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That was a great show. Yeah, absolutely. I I hope that I get a uh, a plaque or whatever they're supposed to send well, you when you you I used to you the, used to you used to call it a trophy. A trophy. Now, I know our, it's progress that we you're now you're calling. I know. It, yes, it is a. But plaque. I want I want a trophy, but I, I know. definitely want a plaque. Maybe I know. Do I, you get anything when you reach two hundred thousand? You should. I, well, especially I don't if know. you haven't gotten the thing you were supposed to get in the first place. Yeah, who knows what the deal with the? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you'll get it at some point, but. I think maybe it's probably like a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, a million, and then after that, right. It's like, so we got to get to a million, guys. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, this has been great, and also, um, we're gonna keep all of this uh public because these are really important stories, and I don't feel like we should be patroning them, but we will be having some Patreon only content, and um, uh, maybe I'll be doing a um maybe we can do like an ask us anything, Brad, what do you think for our Patreons? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll do something. Um, but I hope we appreciate your patience knowing that, um, we just don't want to deprive anyone of, I have some animations that, oh, I've yeah. made that, that I could post for people. I don't know yes. what they're going to think of them, but I usually just send them to Katie, but we, yeah, can... let's have, uh, why don't we do a post with a bunch of Brad's animations <laughs> yeah, for yeah, Patreons yeah. Yeah. and then everyone else can get later, but early release yeah. for Patreons. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Thank you, AOD. Katie's doing God's work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, again, thank you so much. And uh, we will see you next week. And we're going to have a great show, as always. And keep the faith. And um, I'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Okay, calm down. You got rivers, man. You got rivers.